It's funny, I gave a uh, shorter version of this talk in Seattle a few weeks ago when they introduced the talk as a talk about parathyroid hormones, so I'm getting, I'm getting kind of used to this. So like Dr. Golper, I've also included my email, and if you want to trash talk me on Twitter, you can also do that. So just some disclosures. So I have previously received funding for a randomized trial in PD patients from Baxter. Uh, Happy to report that study is almost over. Uh, I was a member of the ISPD guideline committee, that's why I'm here today. And I'll confess that by the end I was rather disgruntled. Uh, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about the uh, disclosures in, in general in conflicts. So as an overview, it's beautiful here in Vancouver. I'm gonna try to depress you anyway. <laughs> so we're gonna look at what I would describe is really a sad state of affairs for uh, PD and quality of uh, research. And uh, we've heard a little bit about NARC and hopefully that will be a step uh, forward for us. I'd like to review the issues of conflict of interest with uh, guideline uh, writing, uh, just so that you always have a bit of a healthy level of skepticism when reviewing guidelines and don't accept them, you know, sort of blindly. Uh, talk about how we grade literature to develop guidelines, that's called the grade system. And then just briefly talk about the unique challenges of reviewing literature in a unique population like PD patients. And as we did come up with 46 recommendations and suggestions at the end, I'm not going to go over all 46 of them, so I will select a few and then depress you at the end again. <laughs> we got some work to do. And then if you look at these, so these are circles, these represent the number of patients that have been in a trial, a, a properly conducted randomized trial with blinding. So looking at warfarin versus placebo, there are no studies on dialysis patients, PD or hemo. Beta blockers versus placebo and heart failure, important area. A very small number of patients in hemo, none in PD. ACE inhibitors or ARBs versus placebo with looking at residual renal function, again, a very small number in hemo, none in PD. And as Dr. Golper was saying earlier, the only area really where we have some patients, and it's really only about 250, is statins versus placebo, and that's from the SHARP trial. So again, in nephrology in general, we're not producing a lot of high quality data, and in PD in particular, again, smaller patient numbers to work with, uh, but we're not doing a great job, and again, this is where we need to collaborate so guidelines, so we're developing guidelines. Um, it's always a good, good idea to declare your potential conflicts of interest. So this is a, a list of sort of things thou shalt do that was published uh, in my hometown in McMaster. So these were three sort of things they said you probably should do if you're gonna develop guidelines. So individuals, if they have conflicts of interest, Okay, they shouldn't necessarily be excluded from the guideline development, but when you're voting on a specific recommendation, you probably shouldn't vote on that. So unfortunately for our guidelines, we didn't uh, adhere to that. Uh, the chair shouldn't have a conflict of interest and we were not able to do that. And finally, the evidence summary should be produced by unconflicted methodologists. We were not able to do that because we frankly didn't have the money to have people do that, so we had to do all the work ourselves. So. Unfortunately, and again, small community, uh, it's, it's difficult to find people who don't have any conflicts at all, but you do have to kind of keep that in mind when you're reviewing the guidelines. Uh, conflicts of interest in guidelines are not unique to nephrology, not unique to PD. This is a, you know, on the top there you can see uh, a snapshot of 45 different guidelines that were developed in all different areas, and the bars represent the proportion of the guideline authors that had a conflict of interest. And over on the right there is 100% is the biggest number. And the types of conflicts are things like being on, a, on an ad board or being a consultant, um, being involved in various types of educational activities or speaking on behalf of a, of a particular company. Um, but then a significant proportion are being, like for example myself, when I declare that you're involved in, in uh, research. So, there's a variety, and even some will have stocks. So how do we fare the ISPD guidelines? So there were 12 authors, 10 had some type of conflict, so there were two authors that did not. Uh, so we were sort of in the 80% category. The total number of conflicts were 104, 
the record was 33 conflicts for one individual. Um, the types of conflicts are things like, again, being on ad board. But you can see 80% were conflicts because of they do investigations. You know, and again, the reality is in PD, a very small number of companies that are dedicated to PD, it's difficult to do research without their support. So I tell you all this just so you keep that in mind when you're deciding whether or not to believe me. So how do we grade the literature? So this is, again, a, something that's developed in, uh, a big part of this came from McMaster. It's called the grade system. Let's try to simplify things, and, and it's, I think it's quite useful. So when you grade something, there's sort of two things that you kind of come up with. One is you know, how strong you're gonna recommend something, and the second is, well, what's the evidence behind that? So now it's just two categories. Level one, we recommend, okay? We're fairly confident that you should do this, and there's a patient perspective, a physician perspective, and as Dr. Gulper was saying about Kadoki, as he learned, there's also a policymaker uh, perspective to this. So if you recommend something, we're telling the patients that most of them will want to do this particular, take this particular course of action. If you're a clinician, you'll want to advocate that most of your patients are going to take that course of action, and if you're a policymaker, you should probably pay some attention to this guideline and consider developing policy around that particular recommendation, as opposed to level two, which is a suggestion. Some, but not all patients may want to go on this treatment. As a physician or clinician, you're not gonna advocate all your patients necessarily need to do this, and policymaker probably needs to do a lot of consultation before considering this. And then the grading is high, moderate, low, and very low, okay? So in ISPD guidelines, as I mentioned, we had 46 recommendations and suggestions. Level one, A grade, none, okay? That's not our fault, that's just the state of the literature. There's one level one B, so moderate quality, and I'll come to that one. And just as a reference, the K-Diago lipid guidelines only had nine in total, two A1s, K-Diago anemia, 47, similar to us with two of the A1s. When you're thinking about, when you're looking at the literature, one of the things we're dealing with is, okay, there's not a lot out there in PD. What else should we be looking at? In the ideal world, we'd have these huge randomized trials, international trials, well-conducted, thousands and thousands of patients, and we could use that literature to guide us, but we don't have much of that. So you have all these other sort of areas you need to think about. Should we extrapolate from a really well-conducted trial in hemo, or maybe in CKD, or maybe a not-so-good study in PD, or hemo, or CKD? or got a bunch of experts in the room or on the call or on the email thread, maybe we should just see what they say. So lots of options that we had to kind of struggle with and recognizing that not necessarily everything that works in the general population or in a hemodialysis patient is necessarily gonna extrapolate to the PD patient. So there were two publications, a very pretty sort of organization of the authors you can see there. It always makes me want to have a glass of wine when I look at it. So the first part looked at managing, assessing and managing their risk factors. So again, I'm just going to select a few. So one of the ones that I was involved with was uh, this particular area, and this was looking at um, the use of ACE inhibitors or angiotensin receptor blockers to preserve residual renal function. So we suggested, so not a recommendation, a suggestion, and the level of evidence was C, which is low. And the rationale for that was extrapolating from the general population. There's quite good data to support this, but we really only had two small randomized open label, not blinded trials to guide us, small numbers. And this is one example here. This was a randomized trial of 60 patients on PD that were randomized to either get in, I think this one was an ACE inhibitor, the other trial was an ARB. And there was a significant um, preservation of residual renal function, so their renal function declined more slowly, and there was a lower risk of becoming aneuric. But it was an open label, only 60 patients. Then things got ugly, okay? I won't tell you who the guy is on the ground there about to get it, um, but there's a lot of disagreement about the next one. So we, this was a suggestion, so we suggest neutral pH, low GDP, 
GDPPD solutions. That's not a very catchy phrase, so we're talking about the biocompatible solutions may be considered for better preservation of residual renal function if used for at least 12 months. And that was a 2B. So as I said, there was a fair bit of disagreement about this one. The rationale behind this was uh, the single largest RCT, that's the balanced trial, did not actually, was not a positive trial, despite uh, many who seem to think it was. Uh, so for the primary outcome, it was a negative study. They did demonstrate a delay in time to aneurysm, which was a secondary outcome. There was a systematic review done of generally poor studies in addition to balance that suggested if you looked at the subgroup of studies that looked at patients for at least one year, there was a benefit. So recognizing all these limitations, the potential cost implications, um, you could consider using these solutions to preserve residual renal function. And of course, one of the arguments about this was that, well, the reason why perhaps that residual renal function is preserved is because patients are volume overload. And this is a debate that went back and forth. And in the end, the, uh, the majority prevailed. And this is a systematic review of forest plot just showing uh, for, in particular, for studies that were more than one year, yes, indeed, there was evidence that residual renal function was preserved. We recommended regular monitoring of peritoneal ultrafiltration at least every six months and more often if clinically indicated. I think most of us do this. I'm not sure how much we always look at the information we get. Um, but if we are doing adequacy testing, we'll often collect this type of information. And the rationale behind it is we know prospectively peritoneal ultrafiltration predicts outcomes how often we should measure whether having the information and doing something about it changes things we don't know. So now we come to our, oh, you can see with the, that was supposed to be over the 1B. That was my 1-1B here. So we recommend, so this is level one, so that once daily icodextrin be considered as an alternative to hypertonic glucose solutions for the long dwell in patients who are having difficulty maintaining euvolemia. So if they're fluid overloaded, you should use icodextrin, particularly in high, high average transporters. I suspect the majority uh, in the audience here would agree with that. Is there evidence behind that? So here's a Cochrane systematic review showing uh, increased daily ultrafiltration with icodextrin, decreased risk of uncontrolled fluid overload without, and I think this is important, without evidence of loss of residual renal function uh, as the cost of doing that, uh, and a signal but no, no clear uh, drop in urine volume using icodextrin. So that was their only 1B statement. Then we get to, for hypertension, of course, there's really no data for PD at all. Um, we're all kind of shooting in the dark here when we're deciding what our blood pressure target is in our patients on PD and, frankly, hemodialysis as well. This was a 1D statement, so we recommended this, but we admitted that the data for was very low, and very low means there's a good chance that you're completely wrong, sort of paraphrasing. So, you know, in retrospect, when I sort of put this talk together, I thought, why on earth did we make it a 1D? You know, it should be a 2D, but anyway. So the rationale is, again, we know that really high blood pressure seems to increase mortality. Um, but on the other hand, there is lots and lots of data sort of describing the sort of U-shape or J-shape curve that low blood pressure seem to be associated with bad outcomes as well. Again, no randomized trials to guide us. We were getting pretty tired by this point. So we kind of like looked around a bit and said, has anybody done any of this work that we can kind of quickly move on to other things? So yes, so KDIGO, as I mentioned before, had looked at lipid management, had looked at anemia management, so we just endorsed them and quickly moved on. So I won't go into those. Um, because there's no, not a lot of data to guide us here, we had all kinds of ideas for research priorities and you know, for those involved with NARC, you might want to look at this because this is an area where some experts got together and said these are the things that we think we should focus on. So for example, those neutral pH, low GDP solutions, uh, a really large randomized trial with important outcomes like residual renal function and other patient outcomes uh, would be a good idea. Um, Icodextrin looking at heart outcomes like you know, perhaps hospitalizations, heart failure, mortality, that would be great. 
uh, one study that I'm, I'm involved in, we're going to hear about bioimpedance uh, in the next talk, looking at the use of various interventions to guide volume management in these patients would be a good idea, and so forth and so forth. So basically, we need to do a lot of randomized trials in PD. So the second part, uh, the uh, heading there is incorrect. It's looking at the management of cardiovascular complications. So what do we do in terms of things like stroke, heart attacks, heart failure? So coronary artery disease, so here's a 2D, so we're suggesting it, and really we don't have much to base this on. So we said patients with ischemic heart disease, we should use antiplatelet agents, like for example aspirin. The data for this primarily extrapolated from the general population. Um, the authors of this particular section had identified that patients with end-stage renal disease aren't always are less likely to be put on antiplatelet therapy, and that was a potential concern. Um, we all recognize, however, that our patients are more prone to bleeding, so um, certainly as, as secondary prevention, we suggested that you do go ahead with this, but again, the data is not really there. And there's that stupid box in the wrong place. Uh, so what about patients with heart failure, left ventricular dysfunction, LVH? So we said you should treat these patients with an ACE or an ARB based on, again, 2D. So it's a suggestion, low quality, very low quality data. There was one randomized trial, again, recognizing great data in the general population for patients with heart failure. There was one randomized trial looking at sort of long-term outcomes in hemodialysis patients, an interesting study that compared ACE inhibitors versus ACE plus ARB, um, and I'll show that with a uh, stupid box there again. So this was a, an interesting study, I think, I'm trying to remember, it's either 180 or 350 hemodialysis patients um, published in JAK. So these were patients that were already on an ACE inhibitor and either added placebo or talmasartan. Um, were these patients representative? So they're all supposed to have sort of um, um, cardiomyopathy, 92% of these patients had fistulas, uh, and only 28% were diabetic. So maybe not the typical patients that we would see, um, but be that as it may, it did appear that ACE inhibitor plus telmosartan improved survival. So dilated cardiomyopathy, what about beta blockers? We know that's effective in the general population, so we do recommend it, a 2C statement based on, again, hemodialysis patients, not PD patients, and again, the same group that showed a benefit. And I'll show you that on the next slide. So look at that one, same group. Look at this one. They kind of look the same. It's interesting. So a funny thing with this trial, so they showed carve carvedilol improved survival relative to placebo. You can see the survival curve starts at 10 months, so surprisingly, uh, no patients died in the first 12 months. These are patients with dilated cardiomyopathy on hemodialysis. Nobody died in the first year. But at two years, 70% had died in placebo group. So it's kind of weird. But be that as it may, that's the best quality data we have. I think an area of uh, a lot of interest to a lot of individuals um, is what about the role of mineralocorticoid receptor antagonists, which is a long way of saying, for the most part, spironolactone. Okay. There's a player known and maybe some other players coming. But So this was a 2B suggestion that we should use these if they're already on an ACE or an ARB and they have a blood pressure to tolerate and their potassium is okay, you could consider adding spironolactone or a drug in this class. So we actually do have some data in PD. So there is evidence of benefit in hemodialysis, but there is also a randomized trial, open label admittedly, in PD. And the outcome in this particular case was change in left ventricular mass and did show benefit with the use of spironolactone versus placebo. So moving on to stroke. So we suggested that you should not use antiplatelet therapy as primary prevention. So you may remember I already told you for ischemic heart disease, if they have it, you should use antiplatelet therapy but we suggested that to prevent stroke we should, or really cardiovascular disease in general, we're not recommending antiplatelet therapy. It's not recommended in the general population, and certainly, again, we know our patients are at increased risk of bleeding. And then one of the areas where you see a lot of variability in practice, I don't know what 
what's sort of done out west, but certainly Ontario, we tend to use warfarin a lot in atrial fibrillation in our dialysis patients. And based on some DOPS data, Canada is probably one of the highest prescribers of, of warfarin for atrial fibrillation in EESRD. So there are countries who do not do it at all. So we suggested that we should individualize the warfarin prescription. So really just looking at the individual patient trying to get some sense, maybe using some of the, score, the scoring systems out there to decide whether they would benefit from warfarin. The rationale being that patients with ESRD and atrial fibrillation do have an increased risk of stroke, but unfortunately they also have an increased risk of bleeding. There is a, this stupid box here. There is a meta-analysis only of observational studies because so we have no RCTs to guide us. And this is a, an interesting slide. So on the top part there, you can see the forest plot looking at the impact on all strokes, and it favors control. So the use of warfarin in observational studies was associated with an increased risk of stroke. The bottom part is ischemic or throm thromboembolic strokes, so the more typical ones that we would be treating with warfarin for, and there was no effect. So. What, it's, what this really is showing is that warfarin increases your risk of hemorrhagic stroke. So many countries, many nephrologists would say they would not use warfarin at all. Why wouldn't warfarin be effective in our patients? Well, I think many of us know this sort of story. They're, we're not as good at getting their INR into therapeutic range. We're all worried about the effects on vitamin K and calcification, and of course, our patients bleed. And of course, this generated a lot of research priorities because again, we, when we looked at the literature, there really wasn't much to guide us. So we asked sort of the questions or proposed the research questions would be to look at all these agents in PD patients. So antiplatelet therapy, warfarin, maybe a novel oral anticoagulant if it's not renally excreted at some point down the road, ACE inhibitors or ARBs, spironolactone beta blockers. You know, we really don't have the data to really guide us and we even had some suggestions about looking at uh, the use of ICDs in these patients. Again, these patients are at a high risk of sudden cardiac death. We don't really have much to guide us. So again, I promised you I would depress you at the end again. So again, just to conclude, so the quality of studies to really guide the guideline committee uh, was quite poor. Uh, we really have few placebo-controlled randomized trials, blinded as well, and, and really, it, it's quite frustrating when you read these systematic reviews that are being churned out at an ever-increasing rate where at the end it always says the same thing. We need high-quality randomized trials to uh, guide our therapy. So again, a plug for NARC or some type of research collaboration uh, I think is, is certainly uh, very timely. So I will finish there. Thank you.